Welcome to the IREL Podcast. Are you sick and tired of real estate gurus pitching their next free construction deal only to find out years later they were completely wrong? Worried the next overseas conference you spend thousands to attend will only be used to sell overpriced lots and deserted developments? Join thousands of other international real estate seekers who are looking for their place in paradise without the sales pitch. Straight from your host, Taylor White. Hey, podcast listener. Welcome to the Overseas Property Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor White. I am proud to say this episode is brought to your earbuds, courtesy of my friends at Airbnb. In just a few minutes from now, you'll be hearing from Nomadic Matt and how you can travel the world on less than 50, 40, and even $30 per day. As we find out from Matt, it's not only feasible, but extremely possible when you have the right resources. Airbnb is the best way to rent unique local accommodations on any budget anywhere in the world. The best part, listeners of this episode can get started with up to $100 in completely free travel bonuses. Head on over to irelpodcast.com forward slash Airbnb to get started. You're in for a real treat when I sit down and speak with one of the most notable insiders in budget travel anywhere. Nomadic Matt has been seen in Time, CNN, BBC, The Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, The New York Times, National Geographic, The Huffington Post, and has written the wildly popular book, How to Travel the World on $50 per Day, and is coming to your earbuds from a location much more tropical than yours. Matt and I will dive deep into the world's best destinations on less than $30 per day, how to become a travel hacking ninja, great ways to chop your daily expenses to save for travel, and much more. Instead of telling you more, let's join Matt from the Nomadic Matt headquarters. Matt, what's going on? It's Taylor White. I'm excited to have you on the podcast straight from the Nomadic Matt headquarters. So we can get to know you personally. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Matt Kepnes, though a lot of people call me Nomadic Matt. And I run a budget travel website called Nomadic Matt. Uh, and I've been doing it for about six years. Uh, before that, I went to school to be a high school history teacher, but ended up working in healthcare and in cubicle doing boring administrative work uh, <laughs> for many, many years. And then in 2005, I took a trip to Thailand. And I met these five travelers, and I just thought, wow, they're spending like a ton of time around the world, and I'm not. And all I want to do is travel more. So what can I do? Well, I think I'll go quit my job and travel the world. You know, it was a good time for me. I was finishing an MBA. I was transitioning from another job. So I thought, hey, you know, I'll take a year off, go travel, come back, start, start life, right? Well, 18 months later, I came home, sat down in the cubicle, said, F this, no way. And that was... uh. In 2008, and here I am now, still doing this. Matt, I love it, and I swear it always starts with one location for a lot of travelers, and it's Thailand. Why is it Thailand always for everyone? You know, I think people just, Thailand has this mystique for people. Right. It's, I mean, for, for me, it wasn't so much the destination, it was the people I met. And so I could have met those people anywhere. And, you know, I, my trip to Costa Rica the year before was the one that really got me the travel bug. And then I went to Thailand. And then, so I think it was a natural aggression for myself. But when I talk to people, where do you want to go? What's your number one destination? It's always Thailand. And Thailand is a place where people tend to stop. They go travel for a while and then Thailand grabs them and they just fall into it and they never leave. So I think it has a lot to do with, you know, everyone goes to Thailand, everyone talks about Thailand, everyone talks about how great of a destination it is. Everybody loves Thai food. Like, hey, you know, even the bad American version of Thai food, people are like, let's go, <laughs> let's go get Thai, you know? So there's just an allure about Thailand. And 
the more stories people have about the country that they hear, the more stories people hear about the country, the more it builds this sort of cloud of mystery in their mind that makes them want to visit Thailand. So, Matt, you are doing a lot of amazing things. You have an awesome website, as we've talked about, nomadicmat.com. I believe you also give personalized tours. You've been featured everywhere, CNN, Time, BBC, The Wall Street Journal, and you're author of a newer book, How to Travel the World on 50 Bucks a Day. Tell us a little bit more about yourself professionally. So after I came home from that trip, I sat down in that cubicle and was like, what can I do to keep me on the road? All I wanted to do was travel more. I realized I made a huge mistake by coming home early. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, man, I should have stayed in New Zealand. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So I did what all the cool kids these days do when they're looking for a job. I went online. And I thought, okay, what can I do online that marries my love of travel with something online that keeps me on the road? And I thought to myself very naively, travel writer seems like an easy thing, cool thing to do. So why not do it? Well, so I started my website and it began as a personal resume. It, I had zero intention of doing anything I do now. I mean, writing, yes, but like the tours and right and giving such direct help and doing interviews with great people like yourself. Never in my wildest dreams did I think about that. The thing was just the website was an online resume so I can get freelance writing gigs. But the more people read my website, the more people wanted to go with, hey, you spent all that time around the world. Can you tell me how to do that too? So I just began naturally writing more and more budget travel tips. And as I did that, the website grew. And now I'm author of the book, How to Travel the World on $50 a Day. And a second edition is on its way. I have four published eBooks. I run tours. And uh, people seek my advice because I go everywhere and all I think was how you can you save money and get great value. So, Matt, we're, we're really going to deep dive about being able to travel anywhere, just like you said, using proven tactics and advice for budget travel. And one of the first one that comes to my mind, Matt, is how do we get the money? So how what are some great ways to cut expenses to save for a trip? So. People always just say, hey, you know, travel is really expensive. Right. But I, but I say this. Think about the money you spend in your own life, right? Every day, right? So my high travel the world on $50 a day. That's 1500 bucks a month. So do you spend more than $1,500 a month in your personal expenses? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> no doubt about that. So do I. It costs me more money to live than it does to travel. And when right. you think of like your average middle class, you know, household, they're definitely doing that. So I tell people, you know, you can never save money if you don't know where the money is going. So create a little budget and track all your expenses for two weeks. Everything you spend money on. So you can find out where your money is actually going. And this is a very enlightening thing because you realize there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. You know, I cut my cable. I watched free TV internet. I downgraded my phone plan. I get rid of Starbucks. Cook more. Cook, cooking more not only reduces your food costs now, but gives you a skill that you can use on the road because cooking more is a good, good way to save money on the road too. You know, I, I also stopped drinking as much. I, everyone wants to go out. You want to go out with your friends. You want to go see the movies, whatever. But when you're on a beach in Thailand, you're not going to remember the fact that you missed you know, that bar night out with your friends. You're going to think, heck, I'm in Thailand right now. How awesome is that? So overall, you know, the best ways to really lower your expenses before you go and save more money is to get a handle on where your money is going and cut all the low-hanging fruit. And developing sort of a monastic habit of you know, cooking your own meals, not going out as much, minimalizing all the expenses in your lives. And though it seems very like, unfun because they're like, oh, well, now I'm not going to enjoy life. Well, you're not going to remember all that when you're traveling overseas. All you're going to remember is you had a goal and you reached it. And Matt, just like you felt, 
as soon as you take that one first trip, you cut your expenses, take that one trip, experience something else. If you have to come back, then you have no issues with cutting your expenses because you know what you're going to cut them for. Exactly. Like you, it's once you have that goal in mind, it, things become a lot easier to visualize. And I also tell people part of the savings game is getting into the mindset. So it's a lot easier to say, well, I'm going to save for this trip. Right. I mean, that's easy. But the more concrete you can make that idea, the more you have that mental goal to work toward. You know, I'm going to stay for this trip. I'm going to stay for six months around Europe and I'm going to leave in March 2015. Now you have it's concrete. It's not some nebulous idea. It's a concrete idea and a concrete goal you have to work, work towards. And when you create that, it becomes a lot easier to to cut your expenses because you know what it's going toward. Okay, Matt, we're going to cut our expenses and we're going to think of some fantastic, maybe three to five destinations that not only can we do on 50 bucks a day or less, but maybe even 40 or 30 so we can get under that magical thousand dollars per month. What are some of your favorites? Nicaragua is a great destination. Uh, it's warm. It's, there's a lot of activities to do. The food's cheap. The people are friendly. Very inexpensive flights there, especially from the United States. I, I think it's a very underrated country. Cambodia, another cheap destination. Wonderful place to go to. Very warm, friendly people. Great food. Thailand, we've talked about Thailand. But you know, uh, even though it's a hugely popular tourist destination, it's really easy to go there on the cheap. And you can get a, you get a lot of great value there, uh, even on the lower end. India is an uh, incredible destination. You can get, go there $30, $40 a day. And even staying at you know, a pretty decent hotel. And I also really love Greece. You think Greece, oh my God, it's in Europe. It's going to cost a lot of money. But they were always a cheap country. And they're huge. The fall of the euro, as well as their economic crisis, has really opened it up to even better savings. And you can get some really nice hotels, food there. You get those nice Greek euros, you know, like two euros. I mean, like three bucks. Uh, and so it's a great budget destination. And it's very underrated because people think it's a euro country, so it can't be cheap, but it is. And the fall in tourism has made it even a better opportunity because there are more deals going. So Matt, I'm going to put you on the spot. Name one location that you went to that you were really, really surprised, whether a good surprise or a bad surprise or it's cheaper or it was more expensive. Just something that you went there and you were like, wow, this is completely different than I ever thought. South Korea. I Why went South to, Korea? Well, I went to South Korea and I was amazed that it was just so incredible such an incredible value destination. You know, you don't think of South Korea as being cheap or, well, most people just don't even think of South Korea at all. But I found the people really nice. It's really easy to get around. The signage is in English. Korean barbecue is just mouth-wateringly delicious. I actually really like Korean food in general. You know, there's a really happening nightlife scene, especially in the bigger cities in Seoul. The countryside is just like this verdant emerald green. And it's really inexpensive. For me and three of my friends went out for Korean barbecue. We had drinks. You know, I mean, we, we had a lot of drinks. <laughs> and it cost us eight bucks each. Wow. And I thought, wow, South Korea is like a diamond in the rough, you know. But nobody ever really talks about South Korea. Nobody talks about South Korea. You, when you think about East Asia, people are like China, Japan. Hong Kong, Taiwan, to a lesser extent. But South Korea is just like, oh, yeah, that's there too. So, Matt, I know that you are a long-term traveler. Maybe until recently I saw a post where you said, hey, I might kind of cool my jets for a while uh, stateside. But maybe what are some budget-friendly vacation ideas that you might want to share with people that don't have months and months uh, to spend traveling? People think of travel as sort of this – exotic, I must go really, really far away, right? But travel to me is about exploring the unknown. Right. And that unknown can be in your own city or in your own region. 
So one thing I always recommend to people is to be a tourist in your own city, especially if you live in a big city, right? If you live in Austin or New York or Boston or Chicago, any major U.S. city, there's probably a lot of things in your city that you've never even thought about doing or even knew existed. Because when it's our home, we don't pay attention to that side of the city. So be a tourist for a weekend. And if that seems weird, leave your house, rent it out on Airbnb and get a hotel room. And, to, and then that, that can sort of help get you in that tourist mindset. Find a place within a couple hours away. Cruises are also really cheap. There are tons of amazing cruise deals and you can actually cruise as cheap as $27 per day. So cruises are greatly underrated. And I, and I think that's uh, three things people tend to overlook. Uh, especially the, be your, a tourist within your own city or area. Because people always think, well, I need to go on a trip. All the flights to Europe or South Korea are really expensive. What can I do? Hey, then Matt, then I'm curious. When you say be a tourist, would you hire like a tour guide to show you around in brand new areas? Or is that something where you kind of just pound the pavement and go have fun by yourself or with some local friends? You know, you can always do it yourself or hire like a, a local guy in the sense that most major cities have walking tours. Right. So, so I would just sign up for a walking tour of your own city and, you know, historical food, cultural, whatever you want, go. They last two or three hours. You know, let's say you have Memorial Day weekend off, right? So you get three days, can't afford to go anywhere. What do you do? I would do one walking tour a day. And I would go to my local tourism office or look online and find out what activities are in the city. And I would go do them. Break out of your comfort zone. I mean, that's really what to me is travel is all about. And then I know that you give some tours. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about why tour groups can be such a good value? Tour groups can be great value. And this is also ties into the last thing we talked about is like a cheap thing to do. Right. Tours are also really expensive last minute because nobody wants to run a tour with two people on it, right? <laughs> right. So you, if you go on a tour and there's like you and one other person, you're not going to think highly of that tour. Same with cruising. If you go on a cruise and the boat is half empty, you're not going to enjoy yourself. You're probably not going to come back. So cruises and tours are great last-minute deals because they want bodies on those tours. Tours are a great value for that reason. Plus, you're getting a lot of included activities in the tour that if you price it out individually, you might not be able to work out such a great deal. Now, I mean, tours are a little bit more expensive than generally traveling by yourself because, you know, these companies have overhead that you as a personal travel do not. But I love the group setting of tours, especially for first time travelers. You know, it's not really easy for someone to just be like, I'm going to quit my job tomorrow and travel the world. Some people, they want to wade in. You know, I was a first-time traveler. I didn't know anything. Tour groups can really give you that comfort and sense of security, you know, and help you ease into traveling independently and by yourself. So, so there's that nature. There's the last-minute nature. There's the activity natures. And plus, you're getting a guide who's going to be able to explain to you what you're looking at in detail. So... They're quite nice. And, and many times, like, you have to go on a tour. Like, you can't really hike Kilimanjaro by yourself. You have to go with an organized group. Most safaris require some sort of permitting or organization. So the Galapagos, Antarctica. So for many destinations, you're going to need a guide. Matt, since we're talking about tours, and I know that you've given them in the past, I would love to hear some more about some of the tours that you have given. I run three to four small group tours a year. Uh, I take 12 people, maximum 12. And I do two in Europe, one in Thailand, and I'm, I might do one in Australia. Uh, and so I take people around for about two weeks and we hit all the sort of the big, the big spots, the major spots. And right. a few of the off the beaten path places I kind of like. And you know, we, we go to a lot of like my favorite restaurants, we stay at my favorite accommodations. And it's very much tailored to showing people my style of travel and sort of not just the main things you would see in a normal guidebook. 
So Matt, I would love to get some ABCs of some travel hacking tips and strategies that you might be able to share on a few major things. And maybe the first one, of course, we have to get there somehow. What are some tips on finding cheap flights? Funny you should ask. I just <laughs> actually wrote, wrote a new article about that yesterday. So finding a cheap flight, one thing you have to do is be flexible. If you are not flexible, that's going to really limit your ability to find a cheap flight. It's not only flexible on the day you want to depart, but the time too. You know, if you have to fly out on June 1st, you're stuck with whatever the flights are for June 1st. So, so the difference of a day can mean the difference of hundreds of dollars. Try to fly midweek, you know, leave on a Tuesday, come back on a Tuesday as often as you can. Midweek flights tend to be cheaper. Fly when no one else is flying, or that means early morning overnight flights midweek, like on holidays, off season. If the kids are out of school and it's summertime, prices go up because more people tend to travel, right? So everyone wants to go to Disney during the February break kids have. So go to Disney the week before or the week after, right? Be a contrarian flyer. Uh, Additionally, try to, I love this tool, google.com backslash flights, great tool. Basically, you put in your departure airport, type in anywhere, and put in your dates, and it will show you prices for the entire planet. Oh, wow. That's neat. So let's say you want to go to, to Paris, and you type in New York, Paris, and it shows Paris is $900. But that flight to, say, Dublin is only $600. Well, fly to Dublin and take a cheap budget flight over, or maybe it's only... $700 to go to, to Madrid, you know, fly to Madrid, take a cheap flight over. Or just be flexible with your destinations. I mean, I always use that Google Flights and I type in anywhere. And I'm like, I really feel like going somewhere in the Caribbean. And I just pick the place I haven't been with the cheapest flight. Beach is a beach. So sign up for, lastly, the last tip I'll give related to, to finding a flight is sign up for airline mailing lists. And you know, flight deal website mailing list because sales, last minute deals, mistake fares, they happen and then they're gone. And so if you're not like checking it quickly and regularly, if you're not checking it regularly, you're going to miss all those sales. And then Matt, as far as finding cheap flights as well, I know that if you link some things with credit cards, you can get some miles or some sign-up bonuses. Can you maybe name a few credit cards that you might recommend or strategies that people can use? Yeah. So these travel reward credit cards are amazing because you can collect tons of miles and such. So I always, if you're looking for a new credit card and you want to travel, get one with the highest sign-up bonus. A lot right. of times you can get you know, 40, 50,000 points, and that can get you a free flight to Europe, right? I mean, you have to meet a minimum spend requirement, which means it's usually 1000 to $3,000 in 90 days. If you spend that much, you get the bonus. So I look for, I usually try to tie my new cards to a big purchase. I'm going to book a flight anyway, or I have to get a computer, or I have to go clothes shopping. That way, I can, get, I can hit that minimum spending requirement. Most people can do $1,000 in three months anyway. A great card uh, for rewards is the Chase Sapphire Preferred. One point for everyday spending, two points for food and travel, uh, no overseas transaction fee, and the Chase Ultimate Rewards program is really good for redeeming miles, and they have a lot of transfer partners, so you can take your Chase points and then transfer them over to you know, an airline or a hotel to redeem for free travel too. Um, so I really like that card. I also really like the Starward American Express card because Starward partners with 30 airlines, so you can move your points that way. Just for a simple, no fee, no overseas transaction fees card, no annual membership fee, simple, basic Capital One Venture card. It's simple, it's easy. You know, it's, it's accepted everywhere. And then Matt, I'm curious as to when you travel, what are some good ways to avoid bank fees? I don't know if you take cash out, if you use a credit card or a debit card, but what are a few tips that you might want to share to avoid bank fees in general? Well, one, I recommend everyone gets 
a Charles Schwab checking account. Right. Uh, have you heard of the card before? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so no ATM fees, reimbursed ATM fees if the other if the ATM charges it. I mean, it's a, the best bank card there is. And if you're a member of Fidelity Investments, you also get a similar card with that too. Uh, HSBC is a good one because they have it's only two fifty withdrawal fee, which is better than Bank of America and other big banks, which tends to be five dollars. Most banks will still charge you a conversion fee, and they'll just sort of roll that into your your withdrawal and, and what they debit from your account, and that can be one to three percent. So you know, if you take out a thousand dollars, you know, you're gonna you might pay an extra ten to thirty bucks on the exchange rate difference, right? So if you're never going to get the interbank rate, right? When you go online, you say, how much is one, one euro worth, right? That's what the banks are paying. That's what's on the currency exchange. We as the, low, the lowly people on the totem pole. <laughs> we never get that. We're, ne- we're, we're never going to get it that good. <laughs> but the closer you can get to that, the better. So, I mean, 3% is usually on the high end. Typically, it's about 1%. And, you know, Schwab says, hey, we don't take that. But... Visa takes it, so so it's there. Nobody gets a, gets something for nothing. Uh, so you know, and to get close to that bank rate, uh, always use an ATM. Never exchange cash because you're even further down the totem pole. Never ever exchange cash at an airport. Never use some weird ATM that you see, like like at a Seven Eleven or something. They're not going to give you a good exchange rate. And so you know, sticking to those no ATM fee cards and bank ATMs, you're going to get the, the closest exchange rate you can without paying a lot of fees for it. Love it, Matt. I wanted to hit on one more thing that I know everybody always talks about for overseas travel, and that's travel insurance. I didn't know if you had some recommendations as far as travel insurance. If you go with it, if you go without it, what are some things that you might recommend? Well, I always go with travel insurance, especially on long trips. I mean, if I'm just going to Toronto for the weekend, right, I'm probably not going to go buy travel insurance. Right. Uh, You know, travel insurance only covers you outside your home country, but it's more than just medical insurance. You know, if your trip is canceled or something is lost or stolen, they replace it too. I think it's really important because you never know what can happen on the road. I went scuba diving and I popped out my eardrum. Now, Travel insurance covered those bills. I broke a camera once. Travel insurance covered those bills. I had a friend's father die, and she had to take an emergency flight home. Travel insurance covered that flight. So you never know what could happen, and for only like 2 or $3 a day, I think it's foolish not to have it. I mean, you would never go without having homeowner's insurance or car insurance, even though, I mean, you're legally required to get that, but, you know, you wouldn't go without that. You don't live in like Tornado Alley and think, nah, I'm not going to get Tornado <laughs> I think the theme is you never know what might happen and you might as well have some insurance. Exactly. So, you know, I mean, I, you can get a year overseas travel insurance for about $800, right? So like two bucks, two fifty a day for, for, you know, a medical bill. I mean, what happens if you get injured and you have to pay for a you know, a helicopter, that's a hundred, like a hundred thousand dollars right there. So very good. I, I personally use a company called world nomads. They're, they're a global company. They have branches around the world. I like them a lot. I've been using them since 2006 when I started traveling. Another good company is in sharemytrip.com. They're pretty good. Uh, Clements. And you can always just check with your local insurance company to see if they cover anything. And a lot of times, you know, if you have certain credit cards, like some of the higher end American Express cards, uh, you can get purchase insurance that comes with limited travel insurance for purchases made on the card. Matt, that's a lot of great tips. We're right about time. So what are some final tips or strategies that you might want to share with people listening right now? You know, the best thing you can really do to save money on on travel is to, one, be flexible. You know, if, if be flexible with where you can go and when you can go. At least, you know, if you can't be flexible with when, be flexible with the where. If you can't be flexible with the where, be flexible with the when. If you are flexible one way, you're going to be able to catch deals and last minute discounts and cheaper flights and 
that's going to really save you a lot of money. When you get to a destination, do what you do back at home. Take the local transportation. Then, you know, avoid. I never. I don't eat in tourist areas. Like, don't eat next to the Eiffel Tower. I'm you'll get, <laughs> like, you'll get a beautiful view, but your wallet, like, the food's going to suck, and you're going to spend three times as much money. You don't see French people eating in front of it. They'd be like, crappy, crappy crepes. You know? <laughs> so I always avoid eating near major tourist destinations. Matt, I love it. Anybody interested in travel should check you out. So what are some of the best ways to follow and connect with you? I'm very branded as Nomadic Matt. So my website is nomadicmat.com, Twitter at Nomadic Matt, Facebook, Nomadic Matt, Instagram, Nomadic Matt. I mean, if there's a social network out there and you type in that URL, backslash Nomadic Matt, you'll see my pretty face. (laughs) Matt, you are everywhere. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing about your experiences. And I hope we can do it again sometime soon. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been great sharing and hopefully your audience gets go somewhere soon. If you do, send me a postcard. I absolutely love the call with Matt today, and if learning tips and strategies from one of the world's foremost insiders on budget travel doesn't get your juices flowing, nothing will. You can head on over to our site for complete show notes, easy ways to follow and connect with Matt, and more information about his fantastic website, Nomadic Matt. And don't forget, Matt not only told us how he's traveling the world on less than what he paid in rent back in the States, but exactly how you can do it too. Airbnb is the best way to rent unique local accommodations on any budget anywhere in the world. The best part, listeners of this episode can get started with up to $100 in completely free travel bonuses. Head on over to irelpodcast.com forward slash Airbnb to get started. You have been listening to the IREL Podcast with Taylor White. Be sure to hit up IRELpodcast.com for more. That's IRELpodcast.com. Thanks for listening.